Okay, we're about ready to start. Just want to introduce Jonathan Nadeau, who is the head of the Northeast uh, Linux Fest and also the developer of Sonar Linux, which is what he's going to present today. Jonathan? Uh, sorry, I'm waiting for my computer to. Okay. Okay, I'm all set now. So thank you, uh, Jerry, for inviting me to come, and thank you all for coming out to uh, hear about Sonar GNU Linux. Um, like Jerry said, my name's Jonathan Nato, and I have to apologize for you know no slides for you guys to look at. I assure you, you would not appreciate my artistic ability, so huh. I'm doing you all a favor. <laughs> um, if I start to talk too fast, that's because I get extremely excited about you know talking about Sonar and this topic in general about accessibility, assistive technology, and uh, free software. Um, like, like Jerry said, my name is Jonathan Nato. I'm the executive director of a nonprofit called the Accessible Computing Foundation. You can find that at eacf.co. I'll mention that briefly during my talk. Um, he also mentioned I'm one of the coordinators of the Northeast Linux Fest. We've been, this upcoming year will be our fourth year, and uh, it's looking good that we'll be having it at MIT this time around, which I'm very excited about that. You can find that website at northeastlinuxfest.org. And I've also done quite a few podcasts at frostbitemedia.org. I am currently doing podcasts on using free software and assistive technology called Sonar Radio. And I have another podcast that's called Frostcast, where I interview people that are lead developers of uh, GNU Linux distributions and or free software projects. Or uh, like the other, the other week, I interviewed someone from the free Free Software Foundation in Europe, and I've interviewed people from like the EFF and things like that. So I interview people around topics like that on my podcast also. Um, so I'm a, I'm a father, I'm a husband. We just had our fourth child uh, six weeks ago or so, so that's been exciting and uh, it's keeping me busy. I recently graduated from Worcester State University. I got my math on my master's. I majored in business administration, got my minor in computer science, and I just I graduated also a few months ago. So life's been busy for the past few months. And, um, and Jerry also mentioned I'm the developer of Sonar GNU Linux, which is sort of uh, sponsored by the Accessible Computing Foundation. We have larger goals than just doing uh, Sonar, but that is one of the projects that's currently going on. Um, so a little background on me, I was not born blind, I was in a car accident at the age of 14 and I lost my sight from that uh, right away, that they knew right away when I got in the car accident within you know a day or two I wasn't going to see again. I had really bad head trauma so that's how I lost my sight. Um, before I got in the car accident, you know, probably like most of you, you probably have you know, normally don't really consider like accessibility or assistive technology because you don't depend on it on a day-to-day, -day, you know, activity in your life. Now, if you had some type of disability, then that kind of thinking is always in, in your forefront. When I speak to developers and other people in free software or just, you know, normal people that use computers, I start talking about accessibility and probably, you know, 99% of the time, the people are like, yeah, I know, I never considered these things. I never thought of this before. And it's, like I said, uh, to no fault of theirs because they don't depend on it. And why would they think about it? I've even had people that said, you know, I'm going to dedicate 15 minutes a day shutting my eyes, using the computer, using the screen reader, Orca, and, you know, getting used to it. I want to see, like, how you interact with a computer. And even those people that you know, choose to shut their eyes for 15 minutes, after about a week, they just forget to do it. And they just, you know, ask them, oh, how, how, how's that going? And, uh, I haven't tried using the computer with my screen turned off in like three weeks now. And, you know, so it's just, again, of, of no fault. It's just, if you don't depend on it, and, you know, these things don't cross your mind. And that's why I love giving talks like this, is to bring awareness, you know, to accessibility and assistive technology, 
And you know, that's also a goal of the ACF is to bring that awareness and bridge the gap between accessibility and technology using free software. Um, like I said, when I was 14, when I got in the car accident, I was a freshman in high school, and I was then introduced to accessible computing, uh, assistive technology, and I was using proprietary software across the board. I was using a proprietary operating system. I was using proprietary assistive technology. At that time, uh, I was thinking of you know other things. Other you know other. I was dealing with being blind, and I wasn't really too concerned about my computing at that point. Um, so. I really didn't consider the uh, proprietary software that I was using. I thought that was cool. I believe at the time it was Windows 3.1 or something. I'm not even really sure what I was running at that point because I really wasn't too interested. It definitely wasn't Windows 95 because, like I said, it was in 94. Um, so I, I went through high school and uh, I graduated. And um, so, like I said, once I entered the uh, assistive technology world, I then started to think about it probably after I graduated, I started really kind of pondering these things. So I opened a recording studio in my house in like 1998, and the guy that I opened the studio with, he told me about uh, Linux, and I, uh, and I was like, what is, you know, what's Linux? I, I sort of heard of that, what is it? And he started explaining to me what it was, like, you know, he was using the, the word open source and the term Linux, but what I come to know later that it's really, you know, free software can do Linux, but, so he's telling me all these things that, you know, GNU Linux can do, and you know, he wished that there was actually like really good recording software that would compete with whatever was on Windows at that time, and he would love to switch over to that. So I was aware of, you know, free software and, and GNU Linux, but I hadn't uh, used it at that point. Probably around 2000, 2001, I attempted a Slackware install, and like most first Slackware installs, I failed miserably, and I gave up at that point. I was trying to use Slackware because I heard there was actually a screen reader within Slackware, and I wanted to use it, but I was unable to use it at that point. So I returned back to my proprietary operating system and assistive technology for quite a few more years. Um, then in 07, I heard of this thing called Ubuntu, and I visited their website. And at this time, I think Ubuntu's uh, goal was a little bit different than it is now, but thankfully it was what it was at that time because I went to their site and uh, they talked about wanting to be the distribution for humans and you know mankind. And they had this huge goal of uh, you know reaching everyone in the world and to use free software. And so I was reading through the website. And they talked about how they had this screen reader you know already built into it for blind people and magnification for you know, low vision users and all this stuff. I was like, this sounds amazing. And you know, and I, I, I had wanted to try you know uh, free software in Linux, and I thought this is my shot. So I downloaded, uh, I think it was Ubuntu 7.10, Gutsy Given, and I, <laughs> I downloaded it, burned it on a disk, installed it, and lo and behold, everything worked, like right out of the box. And I was like, this is fantastic. And I started the screen meter with just a few keyboard strokes, and it started. And at that time, I, I, would, I can definitely say the screen meter on uh, GNU Linux was not uh, up to snuff with the proprietary offering. Now it is you know, definitely comparable, if not uh, you know, better in my opinion. Um, so, but at that time, uh, I was willing to sacrifice the performance and how well it worked. I was willing to sacrifice that over using free software. Right away, I wanted to be able to use free software and not be uh, tied into the proprietary companies. So I wanted to uh, have free software running on my computer, be in control of my own computing, and understand exactly what was happening with my computer and be in control of it. Um, at this, probably, six months or a year into me, I, I probably dual, well I didn't dual boot, I had like a, a ton of different hard drives. So I would have like Windows on one hard drive and like 10 other Linuxes on, on my other various hard drives. And I would uh, run GNU Linux as much as I could, but when I just like had to get something done and I couldn't exactly figure out how to do it under GNU Linux, I would pop in the Windows hard drive, get done when I had to get done, unplug it, and then plug the you know free software hard drive back in. And before I knew it, within about six months, I you know didn't plug my Windows hard drive back in and had haven't plugged one in since. So uh, while I was making that switch, I was listening to like every you know Linux podcast under the sun that I could find, and a lot of them would talk about this guy RMS Richard Stallman, and they would say, oh you know he's kind of crazy, you know that he's from the Free Software Foundation, uh, you know it, they would just make him sound like this off the wall guy and uh, you know kind of. Um, I mean, he is a little abrasive, I guess, but 
you know, they, they just get, they put him in this bad lane. And finally one day I was like, you know, I've never actually heard this guy talk. I'm gonna listen to a bunch of his talks. So I found the, the audio site, uh, audio-video.gnu.org. And there was like, I don't know, between 30 and 45 of his talks from like, all the way back from like 1990 or 91 up until, you know, at that time it was probably like 2008 or 2009. So I downloaded all of them and I started listening to them. And I was like, you know what, this guy makes a lot of sense. Now, when it comes to free software, I agree 100% with Richard Stallman about free software and what it is. And I'm definitely an advocate of free software. But I also have to say, I do not agree with any of his views outside of free software. So just to make that clear, I agree 100% with RMS when it comes to free software. And I think he's hitting the nail on the head. And a lot of people take out of context this other things. And they, I think they let that muddy his uh, what he's actually trying to stand for. So um, once I realized what RMS stood for, what free software was, I started reading more about it and understanding that this is what people that depend on assistive technology and accessible computing, this is what we need to be using. We need to be using free software. Um, the, re the reason why I, uh, you know, I, I feel so strongly about this is because uh, if you don't depend on uh, assistive technology or you know accessible software, you don't really understand how this realm kind of works. And uh, if you let me give you a quick history of sort of how this works, you'll understand even more so why Sonar GNU Linux is that much more important and why I feel it'll it'll make an impact that I want it to make. Um, so if you're you know let's just say you're a blind individual and you need a screen reader and you're let's say you're using a proprietary operating system. Mm -hmm. Like Windows. Well, if you need a screen reader, which you know allows you to use a computer, an average cost of a screen reader is a thousand dollars. Now you might find some for a little bit less. You might find some for a little bit more. But roughly, you're looking at a thousand dollars for a screen reader. Now, eighty percent of blind people in the United States are unemployed. So, if eighty percent of blind people are unemployed, how in the world did these companies come up with a thousand dollar figure? It's easy that they came with this figure because they found that these companies found out that organizations and other entities come in and will pay the thousand dollars and then give this the thousand dollar software to the blind individual. Well, that's great. Then blind people can use you know computers. That's fine. That you know the the bill gets paid. They get the software. It's win-win. No, it's not because there's lots of catches to this. You need to you like have you need to meet the right qualifications in order to get this free quote unquote you know screen reading software to use your computer. So you either have to be a student or you have to have a job, which like I said, 80% of blind people in the United States are unemployed, up to 80%. So you know there's a lot of people not getting this software due to the companies taking advantage of people in the situations that they're in. Um, so and another awful thing about this proprietary assistive technology, let's say I get a copy of this. I have a friend, for whatever reason, doesn't meet these qualifications, or there's not enough money in the budget, or for whatever reason, can't get a copy. I cannot share my copy with my friend. I have to tell my friend, I'm sorry, you weren't chosen, or you didn't meet the criteria, or there wasn't enough money in the budget for you. I can't give you a copy of my software, so I can use my computer, and you can't. That's going to put you at a disadvantage and me at a slightly better one because now I can take advantage of the technology that everyone else can use on a day-to-day -day basis. And so not only is the you know budgeting limited and there's criteria to get to get this software, you can only install some of this software so many times. So once you've installed, I think after three times, at least with one of the screen readers, that's it. You need you need to basically purchase more licenses in order to install it on your computer. So if you get a virus or something, you know, you format the computer, now you've got two more installs. So let's say your hard drive dies, you need to install it again. Now you've got one more install. Um, a quick side note, I had a, a um, someone email me from the UK and they said that they normally help out this blind individual when they have computer problems. And a friend of theirs uh, helped them out instead of this person because this person was busy. So this, this friend of his, went over to her house and said, oh, you know, no problem, we'll just format your computer and uh, we'll get you back up and running. Well, they formatted her computer, but she was out of licenses and she had no way of you know, paying for more. And he knew about Sonar, 
So they downloaded it, installed it on her computer, and within 20 minutes, she was back up and running. And within another 15 minutes of just getting used to, you know, uh, Sonar being, you know, slightly different interface than uh, Windows, she was back on track. She was surfing the web, sending out emails, I, and I loved getting in emails like that. And she was totally happy with what Sonar can do, and uh, doesn't even miss her proprietary solution anymore. So that's just a, like a quick side note of uh, Sonar for right now. Um, now back to the proprietary, you know, screen reader. Um, let's say you know there's a bug. Well, the company is either not going to fix it at all because it's not monetary beneficial to them, or they'll fix it and say, all right, yeah, in version, you know, whatever, the next version, you'll be able to get it. So once you purchase that upgrade, you'll have your fix and you'll be all set. A again, it's just taking advantage of the situation. Like this system is not sort of a, not run like a free market system because a free market would let the, the market would judge whether or not the company would fail. And with this system, this, these companies are propped up and they can't fail because these entities come in and pay the bill. If, if us, the market, the blind people that had to buy this at $1,000, these companies would close up shop quickly because 80% of us are unemployed and we can't, even aff we can't afford paying $1,000 for a screen reader. So these companies that make this assistive technology are coming in, taking advantage of the situation, and we're basically pawns in this game of them making money hand over fist and the, you know these entities again coming in and covering the bill. They could they could come in and charge three thousand and would still get paid. So it's it's really horrific and an atrocity what they're doing to uh, you know people that need this software to access a computer. We didn't ask to be born blind. We didn't ask to you know be in a wheelchair. We didn't ask to get in car accidents and lose our sight. And because of the situations that we're in, like I said, these companies take advantage of it. We have to pay an extra thousand dollars just to use a computer that. You know, people that don't need assistive technology can use. Like, it, there's no reason or call for that. So, um, sorry, I'm getting fired up now, and I usually do around this point because it's very. Uh, it's, it's, so, sorry, <laughs> but so this is why free software is important because it's, it's the complete opposite of this proprietary system. Not only is free software free as in cost, which Really, that isn't the most important part, especially for me. Once you start digging deeper into what free software actually is, free software encourages you to share the software. They encourage you to burn 100 CDs and hand it out to your friends. They encourage you to read the software, to understand how it's working under the hood. It encourages you to modify the software and then to distribute the software you've modified. It encourages all of the things that proprietary software discourages you from. Proprietary software wants to keep you trapped into their system and depend on them and then keep forking over your money and take advantage of you. Free software wants to bring accessible computing to you for free as in cost, but also free as in freedom. You, people that depend on assistive technology that use free software, not only will they have control over their computer, but they'll have control over the software they're actually depending on that gives them access to their computer. And that is the great thing about Sonar being free software. People in India or China or other countries, they can download Sonar, localize it for their, for their town or country or whatever they want to do, modify it in whatever way, put any kind of other special packages or references to landmarks or whatever it is they want, and they can do that. They can build their own support systems around Sonar within their country. Sonar not only can bring accessible computing to people, but it can create jobs for people that are motivated, that finally want to create their own job. Like I said, they can build their own tech support, they can learn how to develop and create their own software within Sonar and, and make the accessible uh, technology that's already in it even better, and then everyone will benefit from that work that is done, and that's why it's important for people using accessible uh, software and assistive technology to be based on free software and to no longer be taken advantage or be trapped in this proprietary system. So this is sort of the goal of the ACF, is to bring this accessible freedom, the Accessible Computing Foundation that I started, is to bring this accessible freedom to people around the world. There are one billion people in the world that have some type of disability. 360 million blind people. 90% of them live in developing countries. Those people are not paying $1,000, and their governments are not paying $1,000 to get screeners on their software. The majority of these blind people cannot use a computer because companies choose to develop proprietary expensive software. So Sonar will give these people a chance to finally 
for maybe once in their, in, in their life able to use a computer and bring them onto the internet and experience all the other things that everyone else takes you know, for granted. So now here we are on to Sonar. So Sonar is you know, a, a, a project, a campaign from the ACF. Now Sonar is based off of Ubuntu currently. We have versions based off of 1204 and 1304. Now what differentiates Sonar from you know, any other you know, distribution you would find on DistroWatcher Online? Sonar is focused strictly on accessibility and assistive technology. If you don't depend on assistive technology or accessibility, you're probably not going to be too interested in Sonar. I mean, you can still use it and show off the screen mirror and it, work, and it would work fine, but uh, you'd probably be better off just installing something else. Um, so here are the things that Sonar does right now, and I'll also tell you in the future what we're hoping to do with Sonar. So right now, Sonar can help out people that are blind, that have low vision. Sonar has a built-in screen reader called Orca. It also has a screen magnification software for people with low vision so they can uh, magnify the screen and use it. Sonar also has a font included for people with dyslexia. They can use this font and it helps them read the screen better. Sonar also has a few on-screen keyboards for people with low motor skills. So there's one on-screen keyboard that's pretty much a uh, generic on-screen keyboard like you would see on an Android phone or tablet. Um, but the second keyboard will do predictive text like, uh, like some of the Android keyboards also do. So it'll do predictive text, but you can also uh, set hotkeys to have pre-populated things. So let's say you're always typing in your name, address, phone number, or whatever else you might be kind of doing repetitively. You can type these things in and press a, a hotkey, and every time you press that hotkey, it'll pre-populate the screen with what you've already you know, set for that hotkey. So it'll really cut down on people's time you know, trying to use the mouse and basically click, click on letter by letter for each you know word on the on-screen keyboard. Um, there's also a software included for people that are quadriplegics, where as long as you uh, put a webcam in, as long as the driver for that webcam works within GNU Linux, uh, the webcam will then track either the eye movement or the head movement of the person in the wheelchair, and it will then move the cursor on the screen. So with the combination of this software and the on-screen keyboard, even a quadriplegic now could actually use a computer. What would happen is uh, you can set la the, the time. So let's say you, you move the cursor over to Firefox. Well, you can set it to say, OK, when the cursor stops moving after five seconds or three seconds or however long you want it to be, it'll then click on whatever you, you stop the cursor on. So if they want to go to Firefox, they can move the cursor over, stop moving the cursor, and then it'll then open up Firefox and then you can continue on. And like I said, with the combination of that and the on-screen keyboard, uh, even quadriplegics could then have control of their own computer. Um, we just recently have started implementing a speak recognition uh, software. It's very early stages, but uh, we have one user that was um, booting into Windows specifically just to use Dragon Naturally Speaking because uh, he suffers from like a carpal tunnel. And he, within the three to uh, three weeks, two weeks to three weeks of using this other software, is now formatted his Windows hard drive and is strictly using uh, GNU Linux now and this software called Blather. Um, he can do everything he was doing in Dragon, but now he's doing it under free software and he's no longer using Windows at all uh, for the voice dictation. So we're hoping that Sonar will have Blather implemented uh, maybe within. I would say the longest it might take is six months. I, I really want to do, um, it's kind of, I don't, it's sort of rough right now. It's not very user friendly. So I really want to get it in a much better state uh, before I actually include it. But it is usable. Um, if you know a little bit about GNU Linux and how to do bash scripting and stuff, uh, then it's usable. But if you don't, it won't really be of much use to you right now. So that's sort of the hurdle with that. Um, with Sonar, I have it set so the screen reader starts, starts automatically. So a blind person can go to sonargnulinus.com, download the ISO, burn it, and the minute it starts burn, uh, you know, either booting off the DVD or the USB drive, Sonar comes up talking in the live environment. A blind person can click install, go through the install process, reboot the computer, and be up and running with Sonar. So a blind person from start to finish 
can install the operating system, reboot it, and then it boots into a system already talking. So they could completely install the operating system with no sighted help at all whatsoever. And with the voice recognition software, once that's implemented, you can actually even install sonar through your voice at that point. Um, but like I said, that's not fully implemented yet, but that in the future, uh, that will be happening. Um, so like I said, with sonar, it's, it's not just going to bring this accessible computing to people, it also has the opportunity to create jobs, like I was saying, that people from all around the world can localize sonar to, feed, to, to, to meet the needs of the people within that area, and like I said, there could be, they could be their own tech support for sonar within their area. Since sonar is free software, they could teach themselves how to develop by looking at the source code. They could understand you know, how a screen reader works. They can understand how the magnify software works. They can understand how the voice recognition software is working. And they can either make it better, they can make it stop doing things they don't want it to do, they can make it do things that uh, it wasn't doing prior to that. And you know, that's another great thing about free software is you can run the software however you want, even if it wasn't intended to do that, which is actually kind of the story behind this Blather software. A friend of mine was doing a podcast and he was telling me how he developed this software. He's like, you know what, I just wanted to be able to come home and say, computer, play Black Sabbath. And it would just start playing the music. And I emailed him and I was like, dude, you already got this working? And he's like, yeah. I was like, why don't you email me? You, you, people could use this in, like, on the accessibility side. And he's like, well, I never, I never even thought of that. And so I got a, a friend of mine reached out to him also and he just took the ball and ran with it. And like I said, he's no longer using Windows for his voice recognition. He's now using Blather. And that was all within a few weeks. And Blather was never even intended to do this, but someone saw the use of it and put it to that use. So that's what's great about free software. You know, you get the four freedoms from free software, and that's why I said it's really important, uh, like for people that depend on accessibility, because with the four freedoms, you know, freedom zero is you can run the software however you want, even if it wasn't intended to do that, and that's exactly what's happening with Blada. Freedom one is to be able to look at the source code, study it, re uh, read it, change it, modify it, and that's exactly what's happening with, with Blather again as an example. But with any of the software within Ubuntu, Linux, Mint, or whatever, all of that is free software. You can change it to work however you want it to do. And you know, for freedom number two, you can distribute this software. We can make a thousand copies of Sonar and go to Perkins School for the Blind and just hand them out to all the students and get them to start using Sonar. And, and freedom number three, we can even take those modifications that we made and hand those out too. So again, the places in India or China or Germany, wherever, they can change sonar and, and hand out the modifications they made. That's what is great about free software are these four freedoms. And a lot of people overlook these four freedoms and how important they are. And they're extremely important with assistive technology because, like I said, these proprietary companies are taking advantage of people in these situations and making money hand over fist, keeping them locked into a system, holding them captive, and like I said, it just it's a, a horrendous situation, and I, it's uh, really uh, upsetting. Um, you know, it, not, and not only with screen readers, there's uh, like I said, with uh, the software that where a person can track the cursor on the screen with their head movement and eye movement. There's proprietary software that will do the same thing for fifteen thousand dollars. Same thing with screen magnification software. There's screen magnification software, eight hundred dollars, and Sonar does all of this for free. And like I said, sure, the, the, co the cost is free, but once you get past that, even more importantly are these four freedoms. We are in control of the software that is giving us access to the technology, and that's really the most important part. That's really what I feel what will push Sonar forward, because we can start building a community with these one billion people, and eventually, even a small percentage of these people will probably, probably become developers and understand the underlying technology and make it that much better. And then the free software will supersede the proprietary offerings. And my goal with the ACF and even Sonar is at the end of the day, I want all people that depend on accessible computing, assistive technology to be using free software. There should be no reason to be using proprietary software, no reason that we should be getting taken advantage of, and we'll all be running free software. So those are my goals with the ACF and uh, with Sonar. The ECF, we're going to be doing uh, a lot more Android development, making Android ROMs that are you know, focused on accessibility like Sonar. Um, Google 
had roughly 30 or 40 patches that were submitted to them for, access for their accessibility stack, and they accepted zero of, of, the, uh, of the changes. So I'm going to be forking CyanogenMod mod and making a sonar mod, and we'll be accepting all of those accessibility patches. And you know, probably at some point, the sonar mod, unfortunately, might be more accessible than the uh, the Google offering uh, on Android on you know the default phones. So we're going to be focused on developing strictly for Nexus phones. Um, we also are trying to reach out to companies to make their uh, products more accessible. Um, like the Roku, I'm sure you guys have heard of that. I've emailed them quite a few times. Unfortunately, no one's gotten back to me yet, but I tried pointing out to them that, look, this would be monetary, monetarily beneficial to you if you considered making the Roku accessible to blind people. The Roku has sold roughly one and a half to two million units, and there's, pro I mean, depending on how you really want to count blind people in, in the United States alone, there's like 10 to 15 million blind people. So that's five to six, seven times more than they've actually sold. And I'm like, do you really want to ignore this market? Like, you know, you could, you could really open up an opportunity to sell more of your devices to people just by making it even slightly accessible. A lot of people would put up with it and, and buy it and, you know, start telling one, hey, you should buy a Roku. You know, they, they started to make it accessible. Granted, it's not free software. Um, if the ACF did help out Roku with doing it, all the work we do is free software. We would not uh, participate in any sort of proprietary development. Um, if they wanted us to help them out, we would do something under a free software license. Um, but you know, these are some of the things that I'm trying to do with the ACF also. Um, I guess that's about it. I probably did start talking extremely fast because I was getting fired up. Um, I apologize for that. If anyone has any questions at all, um, you can fire away. I, I would just you can just speak out because I'm not going to see you raise your hand. So if you have any questions, fire away. I have a question. Okay. Uh, two questions. Okay. Do you have a mechanism for changing the appearance of the cursor, like having it larger or flashing or something like that? Uh, I I know it can be done, but I can I can say right off the bat and so on. I don't have anything like a hotkey thing done that can do that, but I could definitely have that done. Okay, second question. Sure. Is there a way that you can uh, take uh, any uh, distribution and have a variable for the uh, contrast, like to make the contrast uh, more black and white instead of just uh, more uh, brighter? Yes, Sonar does do that out of the box. Thank you. Yes. And then one final question. Okay. Can this be used as an add-on to, for example, uh, Fedora? Or do you have to start with a whole new distribution? I would, unfortunately, at this moment, I would have to start with a whole new distribution, but maybe at some point, there could be sort of like a, a sonar repo that you could add to any distribution and sort of turn, sonarize it or whatever you, you might want to say. Uh, currently, I, I, I do not have any builds using Fedora. I have some with Debian right now and some with Ubuntu. Um, I'm also working on getting the XFCE desktop accessible. I have it like 95% accessible. So once I can finish that, I'll, uh, I think XFCE might be the default desktop. That way, it can run on you know slightly older hardware. Uh, right now, Sonar uses the uh, GNOME shell fall uh, the uh, GNOME fallback, and it also uses GNOME shell for people that wanted to use that. Those are the two desktops that I offer right now. I do have a uh, run at your own risk ex experimental build using LXDE. I mean, it does work, but if you're new to free software and doing Linux, I, I don't recommend it because it is there's a couple of workarounds you have to do. But if you're used to using GNU Linux, it's not really a deal breaker. But for the, if someone newly installing Sonar, I, I would t definitely tell them to avoid that and have them run you know, the fa uh, no fallback or the uh, good old shell. Thank you, those were good answers. Sure. Where I had sort of a general question, how much can you use Sonar or ICD? Because I burned it today and I booted up with it. And um, when I looked at the quick start guide, I saw some shortcut keys, including control left arrow to raise the volume and Going down there to lower it. Yes. The volume was pretty low. I tried um, using the key, it didn't do anything for the volume. The Orca key and the spacebar didn't bring me into the Orca preferences. Um, 
I think there were a couple of other things I tried to do. I think I tried to go into the GNOME, uh, you know, use the super key, I guess is what they call it. So, you, so you're using the GNOME shell version? Yeah. Okay. I, I didn't do anything to it, so I took whatever. Yeah. I okay. Had, um, well, with the using the ORCID key, the spacebar key, there's a slight possibility because uh, there's uh, uh, for the keyboard layout, there's obviously a laptop and desktop. So depending on which one of those it was in by default, which I'm not sure which it is, um, if it's in desktop mode, you have to press insert in spacebar. But if it's in laptop, you have to press caps lock in spacebar. Yeah, okay. Well, so I that might be. Wrong image, then, I suppose. It, well, did you try both of those? Caps it was lock. 64 bit, and it didn't say next. No, I didn't because it didn't even occur to me. Okay. Day. Yeah. Um, I, because usually that's something you set. Yeah, I think, um, and I, I'm thinking you looked at the sonar-project.org site. That's true. Yeah, well, I'm sort of not deprecating that site, but I moved the, the main site over to sonar-linux.com. Okay. So. I might change it. Yeah, I, I think I have newer information up there, so that could also that that's probably my fault. I'm gonna have to change that to point out yeah, that was. Um, so, you, so I can run it as a live CD and play games. Right now I'm using Fedora 18 and probably we'll stick with it, but I really have to give things a good shot. I yeah. Mean, I like this being out here. Yeah, I pretty much. I lie about people about it. I guess, you know, not too many Linux books that I know anymore. Yeah, pr pretty much everything that works in the system should work on live disk. So you should be able to get a good feel of, you know, what to expect from the live CD, you know, that you would get once you install it. So, you. yeah, no problem. I have, oh, oh, go ahead. I have a comment and a question. Sure. A long time ago, we had a speaker here at the Linux meeting talking about talking about a program, Linux uh, Emacs Speaks. Mm. I that forgot was who the author was. Excuse me. That was Ramat. Ramat. Oh, oh okay. Yeah. He's, a, he's a big Google developer. Yep. Oh, okay. So I'm wondering if if you could take advantage of that and incorporate that. Yes, actually, it's funny that you mentioned that. I had someone actually email me the other day from Russia saying, hey, I found your, uh, your website and your project. This is really interesting. And he has uh, repos that he that he, he runs himself where uh, you can get like the latest and greatest Emacs with Emacs Speak already up and running out of the box. So once they add his repos to Sonar, it looks like you could just from an app-get install away, install Emacs Speak and be ready to run with, Sonar, with Emacs within Sonar. So you have that option also. What about Speak Up? Uh, well, you can either run Speak Up or Emacs Speak. They're kind of two different animals. Do you have it in there? Uh, no, I don't have it installed. Animals, yeah, yeah, I don't have it installed by default because the users that want to use it could set it up and use it. Uh, there's a slight problem with Emacs Speak right now with like Pulse Audio and uh, running in either user mode or uh, like user wide mode. So it's kind of a really hacky thing going on right now. I'm hoping that it'll be fixed sooner than later. So it's not ideal right now to run it. And the majority of users that I'm thinking are gonna be you know, new to free software, new to Linux, aren't really gonna use the command line just yet. So, and even if they do, uh, Orca works great like in the you know, GNOME terminal. So I myself don't even use you know, Emacs speak or, or speak up myself. I, I can do everything I need to do from just the terminal itself. So I don't use it myself. Do you have a speaking program? Like, is it usable by public devices? Yeah, like uh, here's what. See, it's, it's reading my notes right now. So I can, you know, I can uh, close this. You can like open up Thunderbird. Yeah, Thunderbird's open. So, so, you know, you can search the web with Firefox. Thunderbird works great with your email. You know, LibreOffice is extremely accessible, so you can use Calc, uh, Writer. Um, you can use Audacity if you want to do recording. I know quite a few blind people that actually do some pretty heavy audio uh, engineering using Audacity. You can use Sound Recorder, G Potter, uh, Excel Music Player, VLC. I mean, there's there's really not too much that isn't usable for you know a blind person on uh, on GNU Linux. I mean, some you know there might be some programs that aren't a hundred percent accessible, but if you figure out some unlabeled buttons or you know okay I know when Orca stops talking I'm on this button so I can hit enter. There might be some workarounds like that, but it's I strictly use free software. I, I just graduated school. I use free software all through school. I don't use Windows at all for anything. So it's definitely usable. 
How big is sonar? As far as the size of the ISO? No, as far as uh, to install it, how big is it? Uh, I'm not really sure how many gigs it takes. I know right now the ISO is far bigger than I want it to be. That's because I was using a tool called Remaster Sys to build it. And the current ISOs are like a gig, and they definitely shouldn't be anywhere near that. I've just started using the live build system, which Ubuntu and Debian, you, that's what they use to actually build their images. I've just started using that and wrapping my head around that. It's a little bit of a learning curve, but I think I've finally uh, broken through the barrier of trouble. And hopefully in the next few weeks, I'll be able to build Sonar using live build. Once I can do that, I can see the image getting down to six or 700 megs. Fantastic. Now, well, finally, um, how, at what point will we be able to, will we know that there's some uh, part of Sonar that we can graft onto Fedora, for example, instead of doing a whole new installation. Sure, right. Um, I'm starting to read, uh, there's a, a thing within Fedora called the Kickstart file. I'm starting to do some uh, homework on that. And basically what you can do with the Kickstart file is you can tell Fedora what you want installed on the image. So if I can create my own custom Kickstart file and, and include it in a Fedora image, during the installation, it would include all of the things that make Sonar what it is, and it would set up everything that I have Sonar now uh, configured. How will we know yeah, when that's yeah. available? Uh, no, because the Kickstart file would take care of everything, so it would it would do everything at time of installation. So, so still use RPM, doesn't it? Yeah, well, yeah, I'd be using the uh, Fedora repos, so I mean, I wouldn't necessarily have to repackage or anything. I'm just taking advantage of the repos in Ubuntu and stuff, so. Uh, there wouldn't you know, be any, any work done on that end. Um, and I, I, I would announce uh, something either on the website. Um, we do have a mailing list on uh, the Sonar website. Um, on the mailing list, we, I encourage you know, discussions on anything concerning free software and assistive technology. So it's not just for Sonar. People on there talk about Arch Linux, Gen2, uh, not too many Fedora users, but Ubuntu and Sonar and you know, cell phones and whatever else is being used. So. If you ever, you know, wanted to point anyone in that direction for help, the mailing list is extremely helpful. Um, and like I said, I, I guess I would just pay attention to the Sonar website for like announcements. We do have a blog there, so you know, if I did start making a build using Fedora, you would you would definitely find out there. Or if you wanted to periodically email me, you could definitely do that. I email, uh, I respond rather quickly to emails, so there's a link right to the email on the Sonar page. So you can you definitely always get a hold of me. So the website is just sonar.com or something? Sonar.gnu.linux.com. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, that's on our website. If you go to this meeting, it was on the email I sent out also. You mentioned the command line. Mm -hmm. um, do you read a window screen or do you concentrate on the command line type? Uh, I would say I, I probably sixty percent of the time I use the kind of GUI applications, but like the other forty percent, I'm doing stuff from the command line. So like to install packages in Sonar or remove them, I'm always doing it from the command line because they're just easier. Or you know, if I'm maneuvering through the file system, I'll probably do it from the command line most of the time. Um, you know, I, I use like text editors a lot instead of using like LibreOffice Writer if I'm taking my notes or whatever. Um, you know, Sonar is more GUI based than uh, command line based, but the command line is there for you to take full advantage of it whenever you do want to venture off and use it. Yeah, I do. Does it make sense to use links as a get into the blind? Yeah, I do use it every now and then. The problem with links and pretty much every other browser is they don't uh, handle JavaScript at all or things of that nature. So if you try to go to a social network and log in, it doesn't even see the login information for you to log in. So you can't even utilize any social networks or you know anything else that's like utilizing JavaScript and even uh, some other web technology. So it is useful, but you cannot, you know, it might be 60% useful. You definitely can't have a full web experience using a, a, a text-based browser. But there is, I'm not sure who's working on it. I saw on the Speak Up mailing list a couple of weeks ago, someone is doing a CLI Fox, which is command line Firefox web browser, and apparently that is going to handle uh, JavaScript and everything else that the other web browsers can't handle. But uh, it's still in development and probably needs a, a little bit more work before it's quote unquote 100 percent useful.
Okay, thank you. Thank you. That was a very interesting talk. One thank of you. Best yeah. ever had. Could, could you uh, give us some idea of how a, what a screen reader does, how it works? Sure. Um, um, take this one. See right now I'm at the uh, I don't know uh, probably won't, I don't know if it would help if we plugged in my computer but right now I'm at the desktop and everything is keyboard driven so I'm using the classic no, uh, the known fallback right now in my version so I'm running 13.04 if you press Alt F1 I'm now in the applications menu so accessories graphics internet so if I if I do the right arrow over on internet. Now I'm going deeper into that section of you know of the menu. So now there's Dropbox, Firefox, G Potter, Mobile, Pigeon. So if I press the arrow key back left, and I'm back at internet, I'm pressing down, and that's Office, you know, LibreOffice, LibreOffice Calc, LibreOffice Writer. So if I hit enter, it will then open LibreOffice Writer. Okay, so LibreOffice is open, so then I can just type stuff out. Okay, so I close that. But uh, what I do normally do is you press Alt F2, it brings up a run box, and you can just type in whatever you want to run. So if I want to open up Firefox, I just type in Fire, it fills out the rest, I hit Enter, and uh, Firefox is open. Now I'm at the home page. So if I alt F4, I can go back to the desktop. Before this actually a PPA to bump because by default 1304 is running GNOME 36, which isn't the latest. No. So there's a PPA to get it up to 3.8, yeah. which is what I did on Sonar. And 3.8, I've, I've never been a fan of the GNOME shell, but 3.8, it's I'm almost a fan of it now because it's actually really fast now. Before it's really slow. Um, the only thing I don't like about it still is it requires 3D acceleration, which they switched that need over on 3.8 to using the LVM pipe, which is fine because it offloads the 3D acceleration to the processor. But the problem with that is, is if you have a computer that can do 3D acceleration, you, there's a pretty good chance your processor isn't that great. So you're putting more stress on the processor, making it run slower. So it's not really a solution in my opinion. So that's why I'm you know, using, pushing the fallback session and also looking to switch over to XFCE.